Good morning, church. It is good to be here. Who's excited to be in the house of the Lord? Anyone? All right. Anyone else excited for men's first Thursday? Men's service? Men? Yeah? It's going to be awesome. I think the wives are also excited that they're going to send off us men to have fellowship, good food, um, and receive from the Lord. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to get straight to the word, um, share something that's in my heart. I'm going to be talking about the grace of God. Obviously, it is not enough just from one sermon to exposit on the grace of God. Even from a few sermons, there are many facets. The grace of God is multifaceted, just like a diamond is multifaceted. The light hits it at different angles and you see different things from that diamond. The same is with God grace. There's a grace for miracles. There's a common grace. There's a saving grace. There's a sustaining grace. There are many facets of God's grace that we encounter and that we go through in our lives. However, I want to share on something that I personally received from the Lord that he revealed to me as it relates to grace in my life. And I'm sure it will serve and benefit some of you here this morning. Um, His grace is all sufficient. Nothing lacks in God's grace. When he operates with grace in the life of a believer, there is nothing that is lacking. The type of grace I want to touch on this morning, I call it the in-between grace. The grace that God shows upon believers, upon His people, when we find ourselves in an in-between season of our life. I'll explain what I mean. A lot of times we can have had an amazing past, done great things for God. We know we are called by God. We know we are chosen by God. We are his children. But yet we find ourselves in a season when everything starts to shift. Everything starts to give way. We feel uncertainty. We don't know what's happening. A lot of times we feel like giving up and throwing in the towel. Even though, like I said, we know God. We are in church. And for this season, what I'll continue sharing, there is a grace that God has for you and for me to carry us through it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, with verse 9, the Apostle Paul says the following, For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. Apostle Paul, what do you mean that you are not even worthy? Aren't you the great apostle? Yes, I am. How can you say that you are not worthy? You were chosen to be an apostle. Why are you putting yourself down? I want to say that when the Bible speaks to us, the Apostle Paul didn't didn't just put this phrase in there just to seem humble. Just sort of, let's just throw that in there, just so I'm this great apostle. Let's just throw that in there so it won't seem as I'm this great apostle. Let's Let's just put this in there. This isn't false humility. This isn't something that's just thrown in there Just so it can sort of shadow away from the fact that Paul was a great apostle. When the apostle Paul says, I'm not even worthy. This is something that he's trying to deliver to us. This is not just, these are not just words. Just to to fill in the blank. Just to fill in a sentence. And he goes on to say, but whatever I am now. It is all because God poured out his special favor on me. But whatever I am now, the apostle Paul says, the great, the big apostle called by God. 
It is not me. It is the grace of God. It is, he says here, a special favor on me. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So when the apostle Paul looks at his life, and he says, where I am at right now, the apostle called by God, serving, ministering to the churches, it is not me. But it is a grace that has brought me to this place. But there was a time in the life of the Apostle Paul where he was persecuting the church. But the in-between season in his life before he became the great Apostle, before he became the one that we still 2,000 years later, we read and we glean what the Holy Spirit spoke through him to us. There was a grace that carried him through to make him the great apostle that he was. That is why when he says, I am not even worthy, these are not just words. He fully realizes that there was a grace of God, a special favor of God upon his life. I want to highlight the slight difference between grace and mercy. Mercy and grace are closely related. While the terms have similar meanings, grace and mercy are not exactly the same. Mercy has to do with kindness and compassion. It is often spoken of in the context of God's not punishing us in, our sin, in what our sins deserve. Grace includes kindness and compassion, but also carries the idea of bestowing a gift or favor. It may help to view mercy as a subset of grace. In Scripture, mercy is often equated with a deliverance from judgment, and grace is always the extending of a blessing to the unworthy. A blessing to the unworthy. A special favor to the unworthy. That's why when the Apostle Paul says, I am not even worthy, because he understood there is a principle that in order for God's grace to flow through him and to be upon him, he cannot consider himself a great big apostle that he was. He cannot seem too big, to be too big in his own eyes. He cannot say, I have it all together. I have attained. He realized that whatever he was is because of God. Simply put, God's grace is unmerited favor. There were seasons in my life where I would find myself going through something. And I realized that I was weak. I might have even backslidden. There might have been situations arising. But at the same time, I always felt a glistening of hope. When I felt unworthy, when I felt like I let God down, when I felt I didn't have enough power to go on, there was something that was holding me and not allowing me to throw in the towel. It is the grace of God. In 1 Kings chapter 19, I want to read about Elijah, starting with verse 1. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me, if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. The great prophet Elijah, the great man of God, what do you mean that you are afraid? I dare say that in the life of a believer, no matter our walk with God, there will come seasons in our life where something happens, situations arise, where we are afraid. 
Yes, sometimes we won't voice it. We won't say it, but something happens. We had an amazing past with walking with the Lord. We've done great things with God, for God. But what is happening now? What, what am I going through now? Why is everything starting to shake? He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness. Have you ever found yourself? You're living for God. You're saved. No, questions of, no question of your salvation. You're doing great things for God. You're serving God. Your family is good. Your business is good. Health is good. Finances are good. Your accounts are looking good. And then something occurs, not because your salvation is lost, not because you've backslidden and left the church. No, you're in the church. But something occurs where you find yourself in this in-between season where everything was just great not too long ago. But I don't know what the future holds. I'm afraid. I don't know what's happening with my family, with my business, with my employment, with my relationships, with my kids, with my wife, with my husband, whatever it is. And we start to retract. We still come to church. We're still in church. We haven't left. But we find ourselves alone. Elijah, what do you mean? You're the great man of God. What are you afraid of? Why are you alone? No matter our walk with God, there will always be a season that we will go through. And it's for something. There is something in that season that God wants to teach us. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. I have had enough, Lord. May I pose a question this morning? Do you have an I have had enough, Lord, this morning? You don't have to voice it. Everything was great. Family was great. Business was great. Finances were good. My health was good. Things were looking bright. My future was looking bright. Then something started to shake. Something started to happen. I'm still in church. I haven't left the Lord. Why am I in this season where I can see the past and it was so great, but yet the future ahead of me looks so bleak? And, this, and in this in-between season is where Elijah finds himself. You see, Elijah was in the season having come from a victory that was behind him on Mount Carmel. I'm not going to read it. You could read it in 1 Kings. There was a great victory on Mount Carmel right behind Elijah that he witnessed. The Lord was great in victory over all those false prophets. And then after this, Elijah becomes afraid of what Jezebel says. Flees to be alone in the desert. Are you currently in an in-between season in your life? You're in church. You haven't left the Lord. You love the Lord. But you don't know what the future holds. With your kids, with your family, finances, you fill in the blanks. What happens in the in-between season of our life when we are weak, when we are weary, tired, sick, when our health gives way, our finance and stability give way, relationships fall apart, Marriage ends. Families fall apart. 
Am I preaching to anyone? Or, is this, or am I the only one that has ever felt like this? Weak, tired. You don't know what's happening. You love God. You're in church. But yet there's something that's starting to shake you. And you're looking at it and saying, Lord, I've had enough. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go from here. The past, what I just had, just right now, Lord, the victory on Mount Carmel. Why am I, what's with me now? What does the future hold? I found myself in this season before. And I can probably tell I'll find myself in it again. It's not because we are bad Christians. It's not because we don't know the Lord. It is because in these seasons, God is trying to teach us something. He's trying to show us, just like the Apostle Paul said, I am not worthy. But he saw the working grace of God in his life. God is trying to show us that there is a grace and a special favor when your family should have fallen apart, when you should have died from that disease, when your kids should have been gone, locked up, whatever, when you should have lost everything, but you didn't. I've had those times in my life where I am looking at my life and there's a small light of hope that flares up and it's as if I have hope and I start looking to the future that everything will be good and then it goes away. And I would say, Lord, what's happening? What, what, what is going on with my life? It's as if something, everything is falling apart, but something is still holding me. I don't know what you're finding yourself this morning. You might not know why you're sitting in church with everything that you're facing, everything you've gone through. Why are you still here? Why are you in church? Why are you still serving? You don't know through all the craziness your family has gone, why are you still together? It's as if something is holding you together. That something is actually a someone. He is the spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, and he holds us and he keeps us from giving up. When we feel like giving up, when we feel like throwing in the towel, because things get too unbearable, there's too much stress, there's too much things that happen. And when we look at the future, we don't know what it holds. If we're being real, I've had those seasons in my life where I said, Lord, I've had enough. I've had enough. If you don't give me the grace to go through this, if you don't help me in this situation, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because physically, my flesh feels like throwing, throwing in the towel and giving up. And there was always something that was holding me which I thought was something. But God revealed to me, and I'll share that personal experience with you, that it was His grace, it was the Holy Spirit that was not allowing me to give up. Approximately 15 years ago, I was already saved in the church. I had a family, two kids at that time. We had two kids, two sons. And I remember looking at my life, I felt so unworthy. I would sit in the pews, I would raise the hands, sing the songs, sing the words. I knew all the verses. But I would look at others and say, well, they're worthy, they're good. God, you're going to bless them, not me. And especially when things in certain areas of my life were not going well. I didn't know what the future held for me. I remember it was not just the day, it was not just something, it was not just an episode that occurred that, that, that allowed me to have a bad day. It was a season where I was in turmoil. And I was saying, Lord, I'm not worthy. If I'm not worthy, you're not going to bless me. Why do I feel like giving up? Why do I feel like things are going against me? But yet something is drawing me to you. Yet something is not allowing me to give up. And I remember I was going through the season of turmoil, and it was really affecting me. I'm like, Lord, I, I, see, I see you blessing others. I see other families being blessed, other husbands. I see they're so successful. They're so prosperous. 
And, and we're not talking just finances now. And I would see myself as less than. I would say, Lord, what does the future hold for me? For my family, for my kids, for my finances? Am I going to have a good future? Or what I'm feeling and going through right now, this is my future. And I remember I was driving once. I called a person. This person was a person of God. I didn't tell this person what I was going through on the inside. And we just started praying. And, this, and God used this person in the prophetic. I'm very cautious personally when it comes to the prophetic. I believe in the prophetic gift that God gave to the church. But I never ran around after just prophecies and, and stuff. I would always go to the word and to, the, and to God. But I remember driving and this, and this person started praying with me. I didn't tell him what I was facing. But I had this sense of, Lord, I'm with you. But something's not adding up. Something's not clicking. But why, are you, why am I still holding on as if it feels sometimes by a thread? And I want to share what this was spoken to me. This isn't the Bible. This is personal revelation for me that helped me. And I remember God spoke through this person and said, My son, this is my grace. Don't run from it. Accept my grace and live in my grace. When those words were spoken, the reason I know it was of the Holy Spirit is because the trajectory of my life changed. God took all of that doubt, everything that I felt, and turned it and I realized, Lord, everything I am facing, all the things I'm going through, but yet something is holding me. Something is not allowing me to give up. It is your grace. It is the Spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit, that is carrying me through. It wants to take me somewhere where only you have prepared for me. Because only God knows the plans that He has for us. I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know what uncertainty. But I know one thing. The grace of God. The spirit of grace. It's not a something that's holding you. It's the Holy Spirit. Because he is taking you. And just like it happened with Elijah. When he says I've had enough. Take my life. I am no better than anybody else. It says, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. The grace of God will always find you in that season where you feel like giving up, when nothing is making sense, and God will sustain you. Because if God would not have sustained this man of God, he would have died. But God sustained him, carried him through. And he, and he goes on to say, so, and, he said, and it says, so he got up and ate and drank. And the food gave him enough strength. The food gave him enough strength. You might be thinking, I barely have enough strength to go on. I don't know how another month is going to go by. I don't know how another week is going to go. Another year. That is the grace of God operating in your life. He's giving you enough strength to face and go through what you are going through. Why? Gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. God always has a destination to take us somewhere. When he brought Elijah to the mountain of God, he gave Elijah guidance and instructions on what he was to do. He told him to anoint Elisha oh, after him. So in this season, on the heels of having a great victory on Mount Carmel, finding himself in the season where nothing's making sense, I've had enough. Grace sustains him. And, and says, you have a way to go to the mountain of God. Your situation that you're facing... With your family, kids, business, finances, health, whatever it is, there is a destination that God wants to take you. He wants to bring you to his mountain. So he can give you guidance and instructions. Not to harm you, not to destroy you, but to prosper you and to bless you.
And I remember when God spoke to me, I said, Lord, if this is your grace and work in my life, I accept it. It's been 15 years approximately since that time. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. Nor do I have to. Because I know that the grace of God is with me. The grace of God is with my family. The grace of God is with my business, finances, health. And even if seasons of uncertainty come, He will always sustain me. Because His plans for you and me are to give us a hope, to give us a future. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not going to read it from verse 1. But Paul speaks about his vision and he talks about his great revelations that were given to him by God. Please keep, in, please keep a mental note of what we read when we started. That Paul said, I am not worthy. And in verse 7 it says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. I am not going to get into te theological debates about the thorn in the flesh. There are many avenues. That's not what we're talking about this morning. I want to focus on something else, on the grace of God. And the Apostle Paul says, in order to keep me from being conceited, puffed up, to think that I am better, that I am so eloquently spoken, that I am so well versed, I am so mightily used, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. The great apostle Paul realized there was something in his flesh. It doesn't say in his spirit. Because in his spirit, he was connected to God. In our spirits, we are connected to God. We are on fellowship with God. But in our flesh... We have thorns in our flesh. Just like Elijah had a thorn in his flesh that was Jezebel. That didn't give it, that all peace was lost. And he said, I've had enough. The apostle Paul came to God and said three times, Lord, take it away from me. We will always have something in our flesh, not in our spirit, in our flesh. As believers, as followers of Christ. That can affect us. That can make us lose our peace. That could make us come to a point like Elijah saying, I've had enough, Lord. This situation, this thorn in my flesh, whatever it is, it might, for somebody it might be with your children, with your spouse, your family's falling apart. You don't know if your family's going to be held together for, um, for the next um, season or the next year. You don't know if your business is going to make it. You don't know anything. You don't know if your finances are going to sustain you. And this thorn in the flesh is bothering you. And all you're doing is you're praying, Lord, take it away. Just like the Apostle Paul did. And believe me, I'm not judging you. I've had those moments where I would spend seasons fasting, praying, Lord, may this, go, may this cup be uh, past me. Go past me. Take it away. But look at what God says. But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In order for God's grace to be sufficient in your life, for God's grace to flow and operate, He does not need to take out the thorn from your flesh. The thorn in your flesh, the situation you and I might be facing and going through, does not stop God from operating in our life. That's what trips us up. We think if God's grace is operating, everything should be good. There should be no problems. There should be no issues with my family, with my kids, with anything else. But that's not the case. After the Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul, asked three times for it to be gone, it really bothered him. But God said, my grace is sufficient. You can walk around with the thorn in your flesh... And my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. And he goes on to say, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, 
so that Christ's power may rest on me. How we want God's power to rest on us and our families and our kids. We want the power of God. But we think when we have the power of God resting on me, I'm just going to command all problems left and right to flee. They're going to leave all disease, everything, sickness, everything's going to be gone. But that's not what Apostle Paul says. He said, I pleaded three times, take this away from me. I'm, the, I'm an apostle. I'm serving, I'm ministering. Why is this thorn in my flesh? And he says, my grace is sufficient. And when you think you are weak, when you think that everything is going wrong, when you rely on me, when you turn to me, that is when my grace flows through you and that is when my power is upon you. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. His grace makes us strong and gives us endurance to keep going and not give up. That is why in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle. Yet, it was not I but God who was working through me by His grace. He saw that in his flesh, there was nothing to boast about. And the Bible says that all boasting can be removed because there is nothing we can boast about because of our flesh. And the Apostle Paul says, everything that I am, everything I have attained, where I have gotten to from going from persecuting the church to the in-between season and where I am now, being the Apostle, is by the grace of God. Before we go into prayer, I want, us, I want to leave us with a few more passages and thoughts. Pastor Vlad Kalinuk preached a very good ser sermon last Sunday. He spoke about Samson, the demise of Samson. If, if you didn't listen to it, I urge you to go find it on YouTube and listen to it. But he spoke about the demise of Samson. Samson was a person, a man of God, that was called an anointed. He was mightily used by God. God's grace was upon Samson. But something occurred, and I'm not going to go into that because Pastor Vlad shared about the demise. And something, what happens when... The grace that God pours out on an individual, when that grace is not accepted. When the correction of the Holy Spirit is not accepted. In James chapter 4, verse 6, if we could please rise to our feet. It says, And he gives grace generously, as the scriptures say. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Pride came into Samson's life. Well, as he was being used by God, as the power of God rested on him and he was being used by God, God was telling him, Samson, don't do that. Stop doing that. But the pride in Samson's, in Samson's life made God oppose him. There comes a point, and this is where Pastor Vlad's sermon can take over, that if we oppose what God is doing, the grace that he's attempting to let into our life, something else occurs. But it says, and he gives grace generously. God is eager to give you grace generously for the area that you need. When we ask of him. But he gives grace to the humble. That is why I'll wrap up with the same verse I started. When the Apostle Paul says, For I am the least of all the apostles, 
In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out a special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by His grace. When we come to God in humility, and humility is not putting ourselves down. Humility is not when we think we're not worthy of Him. Humility is to say, Lord, even if I can't be the great apostle, I am nothing without you. What I am today, just like Apostle Paul said, is by your grace. When the situation you are dealing with, when you stop relying on the connections you have, the finances, whatever it is, and you say, Lord, in order for me to overcome this, in order for me to get to a place that you want me to be, where you want my family to be, I need your grace. Please give me the grace. I, I have prayed this prayer many times and I continue to pray. When I face situations, I say, Lord, give me the grace for this area of my life. I cannot do this on my own. I refuse to rely just on flesh. I refuse to rely on doctors. I refuse to rely on connections. And God can use all of that. But when we keep in mind that it was His grace, the connection that helped me get through the season, it was His grace. The health disease or sickness that I was facing or my wife or my kids were facing that we got through, yes, it was thanks to doctors, but it was His grace. When we acknowledge Him, that is humility. And God says he pours it out generously. I don't know what you might be facing, but as we go into prayer, maybe you're in that season where you don't know why you're holding on. You don't know why you've been holding on. You don't know why you're in church even this Sunday. Because things are bad. Things are not going well. And, and, you, and you don't know what's holding you. That's the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is holding you. That's the Spirit of grace. That is a sustaining grace for your in-between season. He is carrying you through. And you need to acknowledge that. Maybe some of us need to, just like Samson, realize that yes, God is using us. Yes, we are called. We are in church. We are anointed. But there are certain areas that God is drawing his attention to and saying, Son, daughter, you need to stop. My grace is with you. Yes, I'm with you. I'm not punishing you. But you need to stop. I know one thing, when we come to God in humility, when we acknowledge Him, when we don't rely upon ourselves, He is the one that will help us. He will carry us through. He will give grace for you to deal with your children. He will, he will give grace for your marriage to start being restored. He will gr give grace for your business, your finances. His grace is sufficient. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you that your grace is sufficient. And alongside Apostle Paul, Lord, we want to say, I am not even worthy to be called what I am. I am not even worthy to be where I am right now. But it is because of your grace that I am here. It is because of your grace my family has not fallen apart. It is because of your grace I am still alive. It is because of your grace my business is still going. It is because of your grace these relationships are coming back together. Lord, help us. I pray for my brothers and sisters who might be just like Elijah, facing that season where they're saying, Lord, I've had enough. I can't go on. I don't have strength. I pray that your sustaining grace would cover them and that they would go to the mountain of God where they will receive instructions and guidance from you on what to do in the next season or what steps to take in their life with their family, with their business, with their relationships, with their children, with their spouse. Father, I thank you that you are for us. Your grace sustains us. Even in the seasons where we backslide, even in the seasons when we don't know what is happening, we don't know why we even come to church, we don't know why we have strength to go on, your grace is with us. It is your grace. 
It is the Holy Spirit who is with us. It is the Holy Spirit who is guiding us. It is the Holy Spirit who is saying, don't give up. I thank you for the grace. Lord, I pray for those who might not even have noticed that they're alive today. Where they're at today is because of your grace. That they may see it and acknowledge it. Lord, we are in need of your grace even when we are used by you. When we are in church, when everything is going good. But you're saying, son, daughter, correct this area in your life. Lord, we come before you. I come before you. I accept your correction. Because I want your grace to flow through me. I want your grace to sustain me. I want your power to rest upon me. Lord, help us to be humble before you. Because you give grace to the humble. And you give it generously. Lord, I thank you. That you have upheld us. You are upholding us. And you will continue to do so. Because we are your children. We are called according to your purpose. We are saved by you. We are sanctified. Sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Who will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace that it sustains us and leads us. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You guys have a good rest of your afternoon and enjoy it with your families. Thank you.